Hello, my name is Roy Brown. I'm the original founder and uh, developer of the Accordance Bible software. And I'd like to talk to you today about a very interesting and specialized subject called Why the Dead Sea Scrolls Matter. And what we're going to do is talk a little bit about the background of the Dead Sea Scrolls and then talk about how they connect to the Bible itself. So let's go ahead and look at the main contents here of the scrolls. First of all, we'll talk about what are the Dead Sea Scrolls. Secondly, we'll talk about the biblical scrolls and the Hebrew Bible because some of the scrolls were actual text of the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament and others were not uh, biblical scrolls. So we'll talk about the biblical scrolls first. We'll then talk about the relationship of the scrolls and the Qumran site. And in the following sections, we'll then move into the non-biblical scrolls and what they tell us, especially about the life, culture, and beliefs of the um, late, the first century in uh, BCE and first century CE. And then finally conclude with the relationship of the scrolls to the New Testament. So let's first talk about what are the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls are a group of about 1,000 different manuscripts found near the Dead Sea. That's how they get their name. And you see here on the map, here with the blue arrow, that the scrolls were all found on the northwestern part of the Dead Sea near the community uh, that's called uh, Qumran uh, today. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, along the Dead Sea. And when I say there's a thousand manuscripts, I mean a thousand different manuscripts. There's probably at least 15,000 fragments, many of which belong in the same manuscript. These scrolls were mostly found in 11 caves near the site of Hirbet Qumran. Uh, that's the what the site is called today from 1947 to 1956, about seven, almost 70 years ago or more than 70 years ago now. And later, more scrolls were found outside of this site that we still uh, call them scrolls along the Dead Sea, but they weren't really associated with the Qumran site. A few scrolls were found at Masada. A few scrolls were found of uh, Bar Kokhba in caves uh, along the shore, in, in caves hidden along the shore of the Dead Sea. But we're going to focus on the 11 caves around the site of Qumran. Now let's look about... Uh, look at a general description of these scrolls. First of all, what is the date of these scrolls? They were written from about 250 BC uh, to about 68 CE. That is, they were written, the earliest ones were written 250 years before the birth of Jesus Christ, and they were written up to about 68 CD or AD, and that time is very significant because that's the time that the uh, very near the time that the great revolt, Jewish revolt against the Romans started, and at that time the sites were abandoned. And there's some scholars that even say that some of these scrolls were brought to Qumran from Jerusalem for safekeeping because of the um, of this uh, revolt. But there's still some debate on how many were brought there versus how many were written there, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. This period, by the way, is known as the Second Temple Period. This is the temple that we read about. Uh, that King Herod built, that the uh, is mentioned in the New Testament. It also overlaps the much of the period of the New Testament in the life of Jesus Christ and the early Christian believers. What are the languages that these scrolls were written? Well, the majority language was Hebrew, and the Hebrew was written in what we call an Aramaic square script. This is like the Hebrew of today, and you see here on the screen Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, the first. Uh, four letters in Aramaic script. There are some scrolls that were also written in the Hebrew language, but were written in ancient script. And here you see the same letters written in what's called a Paleo-Hebrew script, or an ancient Hebrew script. And this was actually the script used during the period 
of the events of the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament. This is, if you look at inscriptions such as the famous Hezekiah's Tunnel inscription, you'll see the writing very similar to this kind of writing. This was the writing that they actually used earlier during the period of the Old Testament. And then there are some scrolls written with cryptic letters that we're not sure what they mean, and scholars have tried for years to decrypt them, but they haven't really fully succeeded on all of them to my knowledge currently. Some scrolls were written in Aramaic language. They would use the Aramaic script, but they would also use the Aramaic language. And a few scrolls are even written in Greek. Uh, some or even biblical texts are almost identical to the Greek Old Testament we call the Septuagint. And here you see the Greek letters, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, and Delta. So that's the languages, the dates, and the languages of the scrolls. How about the materials of the scrolls? Even this is sort of interesting in itself. Most scrolls were written on parchment. This is a animal skin that was stretched and treated to make it into a writing material, and it was mainly ink on parchment, but there are some scrolls that were also written on papyrus, which was a very common material used. It's sort of the ancient equivalent of paper that we know today, but it was taken from a papyrus plant and converted into a writing material that you could write on similar or analogous to paper. In fact, I think our word paper comes from papyrus. Now, the scrolls themselves are there's really only a few scrolls that are actually scrolls like we would think of as scrolls. And here you see the entire scroll of the book of Isaiah that has rolled up on the ends. And I would say this characterizes only a few of the scrolls, and the most famous being the book of Isaiah that was written on a scroll material. But most of the scrolls are really fragments. They're not really physically rolled up like a scroll. They're more fragments. And here you see a fragment of a scroll with Hebrew writing, and actually most of the scrolls are written like this, even though they are called scrolls. A very unusual material that one of the scrolls from Cave 3 is called a copper scroll because it was actually written on sheet copper and the letters were impressed on the copper, and here you see the copper uh, scroll, I believe they're now housed at the Jordanian Museum in Amman, Jordan. And here you see the oxidation. This is why they're green, because it's oxidized copper. So that was a material on one of the scrolls. And another thing they found with the scrolls were these pottery containers that you see here, where they would have kept a rolled up scroll inside to protect it. It was a long, high bo bottle shape with a cap on top, as you see here in the pictures. And they actually found some of these containers for some of the larger scrolls in the caves. What are the kinds of manuscripts that these scrolls were written on? We've now looked at the date, the language, and the materials of the scrolls. What kind of manuscripts were these written in? Well, first of all, we have this pie chart that shows us the distribution, and 40% of the scrolls were actually just texts of the Bible. And of course, when you say Bible, we're talking about the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, or the Old Testament, it is known as. And these are just simply... Uh, scrolls that were books of the Bible. Ten percent of the scrolls are what we call extra biblical texts. They're texts that we know about but uh, from other resources, but they also found them, but they don't belong to the Hebrew Bible, such as the book of Enoch, such as the book of Ben Sirah or Sirach. These were found among the scrolls, but they're not part of the Hebrew, the canon of the Hebrew Bible. But what's most interesting is that half of the scrolls 50% are unique, that we have no other copies of them anywhere else. Uh, and this is the thing that interests the scholars the most because these unique texts, even though they're not Bible texts, they tell us about the life, the setting, the culture, the beliefs, the way people thought at the time these scrolls were written. Now, we want to talk a little bit briefly about the discovery of the scrolls. There's whole books written on it. I'm only going to give a very brief outline of how the scrolls were discovered. Uh, first of all, not one person discovered the scrolls. Many different people were involved over a period of nine or more years. And as I said, from about 1947 to 1956 is when they found it. And by the way, these scrolls are considered, because they were found in the 20th century, as one of the greatest archaeological discoveries 
of the 20th century and the scholars are still studying these scrolls to better understand the meaning of them. The first scroll were found in what was called Cave 1 because it was the first cave that they found in. And they were found, at least the story goes, by Bedouin shepherds. They were uh, lost a goat or something. The goat went into a cave. They threw a rock in to retrieve the a goat and they heard the rock hit a canister, a pottery canister, and they looked in and saw what it was and it was a uh, pottery canister. And this picture here shows a picture of the two Bedouins that supposedly discovered these scrolls uh, while they were out in the wilderness. But they, of course, were not scholars, but they did recognize they were of value, and so they scrolled it, they sold these scrolls to antiquity dealers. And here's a picture of an antiquity dealer known as Kondo. He was one of the main ones. He lived in Bethlehem and dealt in antiquities, and he was one of the earliest and one of the major antiquity dealers that dealt with the scrolls. And from there, word of the scrolls had gotten out to scholars by that time. And this was, we're talking now around 1948, right at the same year as the Israel War of Independence. It was an extremely dangerous period at that time. But nevertheless, uh, because of the value of these scrolls, Professor Eliezer Sukenik, who is an Israeli scholar, immediately recognized these scrolls, the value of them, and so he, at his risk to his life, he actually took a bus from Jerusalem to Bethlehem and met with the dealer and actually purchased some of the scrolls, but not all of them, but he knew the value of the scroll just by reading. In fact, the story goes that he began reading and he almost wept because he says, I'm the first Jewish one to set eyes upon something that nobody had seen for 2,000 years. Uh, and reading it, and he could cite read it because it was written in Hebrew, and that was his language, and it was written with the style, with the Aramaic script that he could also read very easily. Some of the scrolls ended up in the Syrian Orthodox Church with a fellow named Mar Samuel, who was the author, uh, or rather not the author, but the um, head of the, this particular branch of the Syrian Orthodox Church, but he didn't really know what, what, uh, much what to do with these scrolls, so they put an ad, it's almost humorous today when you think about it, in the Wall Street Journal of all places in 1954 saying the four Dead Sea Scrolls. And then they have a little blurb in their classified ads here that I'm showing here. That, and they say, oh, this would be a great gift for an educational institution. Well, quite frankly, they were much more valuable than that. And so the Israelis got wind of this and sent Yigal Yadin, who's actually the son of Professor Sukenik to go purchase the scrolls, and I believe the price was $250,000, but that was $1954. It would be worth at least two to three million dollars today in equivalent currency. But the Bedouins didn't find all of the scrolls. It turned out that there were other caves uh, that had other scrolls, and this is Cave 4, which interestingly enough is very close to the Qumran site that we'll talk about later. And they found about 600 fragments of different scrolls. Now, they actually found 15,000 fragments, but many of them belong to the same text. But they found at least 600 different scrolls in Cave 4, which you see here in this picture. It's where the, it's the cave uh, in the, whatever the uh, land sticking out. And you can even see through this cave to the other side there in the picture. But anyway, archaeologists were able to go to these, although I think the story was the Bedouins sort of found it, but the archaeologists got wind of it and were able to go and uh, restore and completely recover the fragments there. And here's a picture of Yigal Yadin, who was a very early um, scroll. He was an archaeologist, he was a Bible scholar, and he was a politician. He really was quite a man of all trades. And here's a picture of him examining one of the scroll fragments. Most of the scrolls ended up in what we call today the Shrine of the Book, and this is at the Israel Museum. You see the top of the Shrine of the Book. It actually, it's white, but it looks like the top of the scroll canister that we saw earlier, and I think it's even white because it reminds you of the Sons of Light, but we'll get to that a little bit later. And 
but the Israel Antiquity Authorities have most of the scrolls, but there are some in the Jordan Museum in Amman, Jordan, and there's a handful of them that are actually owned, mostly fragments by private collectors. Also, you've got to be very careful nowadays because many of these small fragments have been shown to be forgeries, and that's a whole issue in itself is what's genuine, but the Dead Sea Scrolls themselves are very much genuine. They're not forgery, even if very recently some people have tried to pass off forgeries as Dead Sea Scrolls. Now let's go on now and talk about the biblical scrolls, because I said there are biblical scrolls and there's non-biblical scrolls. The biblical scrolls, as I said earlier, are about 40% of the text of the scrolls. And these biblical scrolls contain at least portions of every book in the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, except for Esther and Nehemiah. And I was told by a scroll scholar that they thought even Nehemiah was there, but he, it may not be authentic. But I'll just go ahead and say every book in the Hebrew Bible except Esther and Nehemiah, and I wouldn't draw any conclusions from that necessarily, like Esther and Nehemiah don't belong to the Bible, but we're just talking about what texts that they use. And there are several books that actually have entire copies. And in particular, there's multiple copies of Psalms, Deuteronomy, Isaiah, and many other books. And so this, so this is part of the scrolls. 40% are simply uh, text from the Bible, from the Hebrew Bible. Now, what are the dates of these biblical scrolls? This is what the thing is most fascinating and why these scrolls are so important. First of all, the biblical text, the age of these scrolls is about a thousand years earlier than what we call the Masoretic or the traditional Hebrew text. And you've got to keep in mind the Masoretic text is the text of the Jewish community today, and it's also the text of almost every translation of the Old Testament, Jewish and Christian today. But yet these scrolls are a thousand years earlier than the text that is usually used in most translations today. So let's just give an idea of the chronology here, and I'll show this in this timeline here, that uh, this timeline goes from about minus 500 BCE to today, and the Masoretic text is about a thousand years old, that's all. The Bible events are much older in the Old Testament, they're up to 1,500 to 2,000 years, uh, or rather 3,000 years ago, uh, from our current period, okay? But the Masoretic text is only a 1,000 years, so we're talking about a time span of at least 1,500 to 2,000 years between the Masoretic text and the time of the events that are recorded in it. But then we do have an earlier witness of the, of the Hebrew Bible, but unfortunately it's not in Hebrew, it's in Greek. And so we do have a copy, a complete copy, of the Hebrew Bible, but it's translated into Greek, and this is what we call the Greek Old Testament, or the Septuagint. And the earliest complete copy is around 400 uh, CE or 400 AD. Um, and, and I know the Septuagint was written earlier than that, but this is one of the uh, earliest copies of the complete uh, Hebrew Bible in the Septuagint. But the Dead Sea Scrolls go back even further to the first century BCE. And, that, and if you look at this timeline, this is remarkable that these scrolls are a thousand years earlier than the Masoretic text that most translations of the Bible today are based on and which the Jewish community uses uh, today. These are a thousand years earlier. And because of that, the natural question arises, are there any changes from over that thousand years as they made copies from the Dead Sea Scrolls to the Masoretic text. So let's look at the accuracy of these biblical scrolls. First of all, most of the scrolls are very close to the Masoretic or traditional Hebrew text. You'll have spelling differences, and when I say spelling, I'm not talking about simply typographical type errors. I'm talking about things in the Hebrew language like the letter Vav, Yud, and maybe Aleph and a few, and a few others where they're almost treated as vowels in some cases, and so sometimes it'll be purely consonantal, other times it'll have a yud or a, or a vav inserted to sort of act as vowels. And these are the kind of spelling differences we're talking about. Really very minor. There's a few differences. A few of the scrolls follow 
more closely the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, and others. But remarkably, after over a thousand years, most of the scrolls are extremely close to the Masoretic text. And to give you an idea of the care for the text that's demonstrated here, I want to give you an example here. And you see a picture here of one of the scrolls, which is called Pesher Habakkuk, or the Habakkuk Commentary. And you see several things in this scroll here. First of all, you see that it is written in what I call Aramaic script. And those of you that can read even modern Hebrew can read this. You see the word Uvaesh in the upper left corner, and you see Tzvaot, the armies or the hosts there on the left. But the main thing I want to call attention to is in the very middle, here where you see the blue arrow pointing to, is that you see there it is not using the same script as these other uh, words are. It is using the ancient Paleo-Hebrew script, and it's got four letters, and that tells us naturally, and in fact, if you can read the letters here, yud Hey vav Hey. It is what's called a tetragrammaton, or the name of God, which usually English speakers say the Lord in all caps. But um, it is the name of God written in the four letters. But what's remarkable is they did not change the script there. They did not want to change anything. They kept the name of God exactly as it was received. And I use this as evidence of the care that was taken in writing these texts, that they did not... Uh, they, they took this writing as a very, very serious duty, and I believe in the scrolls, it might even say, um, uh, it might even say what the rules were. You had to be at the community a long time and be very experienced where they even dare let you write the scrolls. Now let's talk a little bit about the Qumran site. The Qumran site is very closely associated with the Dead Sea Scrolls. Here's a picture of the excavations, the ruins of the site that you would see today. You see the Dead Sea in the background, and this site is closely connected to the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the reason I say that is all 11 caves are within one and a half miles or two kilometers from this Qumran site. In the left, lower left, you see the picture of cave number four, again, where I met, that I showed earlier. And on the right, lower right, you see the caves up in the mountains where they found other scrolls that were kept in the caves and they had to be kept in the caves because out in the open they would have been destroyed along that was the only reason they were preserved is they were kept in these caves now they excavated this site and learned a lot about it here you see the aqueduct because water was very important but water wasn't important just to survive in the desert because this was a very dry area in fact it's next to what we call the wilderness of judea it's mentioned in the bible but water was also important for them as a Jewish sect, which we'll talk about in, in a little bit. Here's a picture of the dining room, what the archaeologists des, uh, designated the dining room. And that's already a clue that this site was like a commune. They shared things in common. And then most remarkably, they found not just one, but several ritual baths. We call this in Hebrew mikvaot or mikvah. And this, you see the steps leading down into the bath. And so you needed water to keep these baths full because these baths were very, very important for ritual cleanliness. That before you would embark on something, you had to go and self-immerse yourself. And some see this as a prototype of Christian baptism, but it really wasn't the same thing. But it could have been an early prototype, perhaps, of that. But... Um, Anyway, here's a picture of the bath. You can see, if you look closely on the steps, dividers that mark the impure steps that you go down and the pure steps after you've immersed yourself of coming out. And they even found ink wells at this site where they would take some sort of a carbon black, mix it with some sort of resin to form an ink to write the scrolls with. And this is evidence that at least some of the scrolls were indeed written at this site that we may now be seeing among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now the question is, who was at Qumran? Well, we know that it was a Jewish community, and we know that it was dated from about the first century BCE to the first century CE, and as I mentioned earlier, it disappeared about 68 CE or 68 AD uh, uh, during the beginning of the uh, Great Revolt against, of Judah against Rome. 
And now there's some debate among scholars exactly what kind of community it was. It was Jewish. There are scholars that border, I would say the vast majority of scholars would say this was a community, a strict community, monastic community of the Essenes. But I've heard other theories that it was a pottery production plant. It was a fortress and so on. But the majority of scholars believe it was a community that was a strict sect of the Essenes. And I say strict sect because Josephus tells us that there were Essenes in every village. And so it could be that this was a more extreme uh, sect of the Essenes. And most scholars believe these were the Essenes, but they didn't call themselves Essenes. That's a name we picked up from Josephus and other historians. But they like to call themselves Yachad, which means union or togetherness or whatever. So the Essenes were are considered to be one of the three main Jewish movements at that time uh, during the Second Ter Temple period. You also had Pharisees, Sadducees, which are mentioned in the New Testament. And the New Testament actually mentions other movements such as the Zealots and the Herodians and others. But the Essenes are not mentioned by name in the New Testament, but they are recorded in Josephus and other writings. And so, and they apparently played a major role um, in Judaism among these other movements within Judaism. They tended, as best we could tell from the scrolls, they tended to focus on the question of how to live righteously in light or in the context of the Torah, the five books of Moses, Genesis through Deuteronomy. They also expected some sort of apocalyptic judgment of the world around them because they wanted to live righteously, but they saw the people in the rest of the world, and we're not talking the Gentile world, I'm talking about even the other Jewish world, such as the temple, they saw them as corrupt. And this is actually borne out even in the New Testament when the very famous incident of Jesus cleansing the uh, money vendors, the money traders in the temple. He saw that it was a disgrace uh, to the temple. And this right there tells you there was a lot of corruption at, at that time. So what is the connection of the Dead Sea Scrolls and Qumran? Well, I would maintain that it's very close. There seems to be a very strong connection between the scrolls and Qumran, both in location and time. They're both dated to around this period of the first century BCE to first century CE, both the archaeologists and dating Qumran and then the scholars dating the scrolls themselves. And the contents of the non-biblical scrolls mainly show the way of thinking and the way of life of the Qumran community. How did these people think? And I talked to one well-known Qumran scholar that said, we still don't really understand what they were thinking, but we're trying to get a good idea of that. Some of the scrolls may have been copied at Qumran, but there's some evidence that many of the scrolls had other writers and maybe even from different places. Um, some even speculated the scrolls may have been brought from Jerusalem for safekeeping, but I'm not sure if that's really correct or not. But, uh, but certainly some of the scrolls seem to be from other places. Okay, I think we're going to stop here and carry the next time, I believe, on the non-biblical scrolls. Uh, is that right? Uh, yeah, the non-biblical scrolls. We're going to divide this here. We'll continue on our next section on the non-biblical scrolls to talk a little bit more detail of it. But what this first section gives us is an introduction to the scrolls. We saw what the scrolls were. We saw the language, the dates, the materials. We saw how a little bit of brief history, how they were found. We saw what the contents of the scrolls, the written contents. And we also saw the relationship of the scrolls to Qumran. But in the next section, we will be going into more the non-biblical scrolls and their connection to the Hebrew Bible. So thank you very much and we'll continue on the next section.